Hi, everybody. I'm here with Mark Meyer, and he is the president of the Polypaid Breed Association. And I'm really excited to be able to bring him onto the uh, channel today to talk about the Polypaid breed and his experience with the breed and with sheep farming. So hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jen, for having me. Appreciate it very, very much. Awesome. So the first question I have is, um, can you just talk about the Polypay breed, the origin, and you know what sets them apart from other breeds? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, the Polypay breed is a true American breed. Uh, we're a breed that started back in the 1960s, uh, was de developed out in the state of Idaho, uh, kind of out of necessity. Uh, a lot of sheep producers out west uh, were searching for uh, some combinations of breeds that would produce a um, a genetically superior sheep that was really focused on prolificacy, uh, numbers of lambs, milking ability, uh, ability to breed out of season uh, or accelerate lamb uh, and be able to withstand uh, many different types of environments or production systems. So we're a breed that's been around, again, a true American breed since the uh, 1960s and have just continually grown throughout the years. Uh, as the breed continues to spread across the country. We're now found all across the country from the mountain ranges of uh, the West to uh, farm flocks here in the Midwest to what I like to call the deep grass states of New York and Virginia and where you've got your beautiful green pastures. Um, you know, so our breed has over the years continued to grow, expand and, and become very popular uh, in the commercial sheep industry. So interesting. Right. So when you talk about um, production and being prolific, that's specifically to lambing right you're not you're not really focusing on a significant wool output or large carcasses for meat it's mostly about producing lambs frequently right right the, yeah them. yeah the origin of the breed was was very very focused on on maternal characteristics uh you know so polypays uh, throughout their history have been known for uh uh, large drop numbers. I mean, it's not unusual to have twins, triplets, and quads with polypays. They were really selected for their uh, ability to, to drop a lot of lambs, right? And uh, mm -hmm. and also to be able to milk extremely good. And uh, you'll find if anybody's uh, involved with or have been around the polypay breed, you'll find that polypay females are exceptional. I mean, extremely good mothers, uh, extremely heavy milking ewes. Uh, and then again, with multiple births, uh, yeah, the, the origin of the breed was really, really focused at first on on, on maternal characteristics. Okay. All right. So they can, they can lamb more than once a year. Is that what you said? Yeah, exactly. The polypate breed, uh, the actual, the four breeds, the composite breed uh, that we started out with, the four breeds that we originally started with were Rambouillet, Targi, Finn, sheep and dorset right so we tried to find uh, back in the early days of the in the uh, in the development of the breed they tried to find traits from all these different breeds that they could bring together to create this really pro prolific hardy uh, female that could survive in a lot of different environments uh you know so uh, you, you you got the real pro the um, the prolificacy from the fin sheep you got carcass uh, uh out of season breeding ability from the dorsets you got hardiness from the targies you got wool quality uh and the ability to withstand harsh environments from the Rambouillet as well and you put all those breeds together and uh, the polypay breed was derived from those breeds for those reasons. So how many times a year do you guys lamb? We just lamb once a year. Once a year. Uh, we lamb, our, our main focus at our operation is we, uh, we breed in April and May so we breed out of season mm -hmm. uh, and our focus has always been producing naturally conceived uh, fall lambs. So that's kind of been our big market at our place has been able to produce lambs uh, that are born in the fall uh, because there's becoming more and more interest in being able to breed uh, sheep out of season and actually have lambs born uh, at different times of the year to hit different markets. Uh, you know, so different operations, the fall lambs work so well in. So uh, that's been our main focus is naturally conceived fall lambs. So we don't use at our operation any uh, cedars or any artificial methods whatsoever uh, to get our sheep to breed in the spring it's all been done through natural selection uh, throughout the past 20 years so yeah so we we just lamb once once a year and part of that's because I also have an off-farm job too uh, um, so I don't have you know as much time as I would like sometimes to put into accelerated lambing or lambing more than once a year so our main focus has been lambing in September October and November okay okay um so back to just the breed in general the gestation period with Shetlands, we say it's 147 days on average. What's the gestation period for the polypase? Five months. Five months? Yeah. So it's about the same. 
About the same, yeah. And is that considered fast in the, because I read in somewhere that your, you know, the gestation period is faster with the polypay. Is that? Yeah, good question. I don't know for sure how much yeah, faster either. it would be. I know, you know, polypays are traditionally known to be uh, sheep that reach puberty in an early age too, though. So, you know, it could be that, you know, that they are mature at a younger age and, and maybe, you know, maybe that has something yeah, to do yeah. with that. I don't know, okay. but, uh, okay. but polypays do tend to mature quickly. Okay. All right. So then the other question I have is I did spend some time on your website and I have to say it was the, the breed website was, well, yours is also very nice, but on the breed website, it's really informative. There's a lot of really good information and I am going to provide a link both to your website as well as your breed association in the comment section of this video. Um, but I just wanted to ask you about what your standards are for confirmation or just what your breed standard is, if you could describe that in terms of what a polypay looks like. Sure. Um, talk about yep. that a little bit. Yep. It's a, well, we are considered uh, kind of a dual purpose uh, wool breed. Uh, uh, so, you know, we are a white sheep, uh, white faced uh, breed of sheep. Um, you know, confirmation is very important to all of us in the breed, uh, strong tops, uh, you know, good structure, bone structure, um, not a lot of wool on the face, uh, mm -hmm. uh, cleaner faces, but still, you know, we still, you know, do carry some wool on the face, but a little bit cleaner faces, uh, no black. Uh, uh, I think uh, I have to go back and read the breed standard, but nothing bigger than the size of a quarter, I think, a uh, nickel or a quarter uh, on, on a, on a polypay. Um, you know, so traditionally try to keep them uh, as white as, as we can uh, and keep the color out of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, how, if you were to look at a, could you look at a polypay and know it's a polypay? What would you, yeah. <laughs> what would you be looking at? What would, what's yeah, the yeah I, I guess how, when I, I try to describe what a polypay looks like to, to, to people who maybe have not seen them before, I, I think they look very similar to, uh, to a Dorset. Okay. Uh, maybe Rambouillet somewhere, somewhere in between those two. So again, you know, moderate frame sheep uh, with, uh, with, with white faces. Um, what's their, what's you know, their, usually their like average weight as adult they'll use? Yeah. Well, it kind of varies between farms, uh, but I would say probably the average weight on most ewes in the polyprey breed are between 150 to probably 180 to 200 pounds on the bigger end. Mm -hmm. uh, Rams probably around 300 uh, to 350. So I would consider some moderate framed breed of sheep. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Rambouillet is kind of a bigger sheep, isn't it? It is. Yeah. 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 But you have to remember too, in, within the polypay breed is a fin sheep, which tends to be a smaller sheep, oh, right? So, yeah. so it all kind of averages out. So I would consider a polypay uh, sheep to be, uh, when compared to most sheep, probably more in the moderate framed uh, okay. size. All right, so this is a question I wanted to ask you, and this kind of, it, it's informed on my, with my breeding experience with Shetlands, with the fact that the Shetlands came to North America, there were 30 in this importation that came over from Shetland Islands. And the Shetlanders at that time were crossing their Shetlands with Scottish Blackface and Cheviot in order to get larger frames and bigger fleeces to make more money, but they were still considering them as Shetlands. So when they brought those over here, they all looked like a Shetland, right? So they were correct phenotypically, but then as they would breed, you would see lambs with traits that were more like the Cheviot or the Scottish Blackface. And there's other breeds scattered in there, but those are the two main ones. So, so we're very conscious of that. And, you know, our farm, we're working towards the more pure type Shetland as it's described in the, you know, centuries old standard. And when we see those traits, outlier traits in our sheep, we select out, you know, we call those or whatever. So I was interested when I was reading this, that in the 60s, there were the four breeds and of equal proportion to make up a polypay. And my question is, do you ever see an, any, an expression of any one of those four breeds taking over so that it doesn't look like a polypay any longer or doesn't behave like a polypay and maybe behaves more as one of those breeds. Yeah, <laughs> that, makes sense. Yeah. that does make sense. Uh, it makes sense. And it's a it's a really interesting question. Uh, I would say when you look across breeds across the United States, polypay breeders that, uh, that are involved in our breed um, nationally, polypay sheep pretty much are very consistent. I mean, they all pretty much look the same. 
Um, you know, there are some differences though. I mean, there are some slight differences we have seen because so many of our breeders are involved in, in genetic testing, performance testing, because we are a true commercial breed. We're not a show ring breed of sheep. We are really a, a breed that has, from its beginning, focused on commercial sheep production. That's what we do as polypay breeders. Uh, our market is not show ring people. It's commercial uh, uh, lamb producers across the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so because we're so heavily involved in genetic testing, uh, many of our members are part of the National Sheep Improvement Program, the NSIP program, where we're, where we're uh, submitting genetic data and, ge and generating estimated breeding values on our sheep. You know, throughout the years, I think you, it, it's a known fact that if, if you're a breeder that is selected for higher uh, maternal traits on um, the NSIP system, are really focused on, on high maternal traits, you might see a little more of the fin sheep influence come out in your flock, where maybe the sheep are a little smaller frame, maybe a little finer in their bone structure, more like a fin sheep, uh, but that's where you're getting those extremely high maternal numbers, right, is from that fin sheep influence. So you might see a little bit of that in some flocks where they've really focused on, on those high uh, multiple birth numbers and, and things like that. Now in our flock, I can go back to and talk to you a little bit about what we do. We've kind of done more of a dual purpose look at things. So I look very close, not only at um, the maternal traits, but I'm very um, very much in tune with growth rate on our sheep. I like sheep that have body capacity, muscle, bone, um, volume, uh, dimension, you know. So our sheep probably, because that's what I've selected for heavily over the past 20 years, our sheep probably look more like a dorset. Um, you know, a more dual purpose looking breed of sheep, you know, so, but you're right, that's a really great question, you know, uh, I would say you will see maybe some influences in some flocks where they've really selected heavily for those maternal traits, uh, where you might see a little more of the fin sheep influence uh, start to exhibit itself. Not that that's a bad thing, uh, it's no, just, an op just an observation throughout the years that you may see with, um, within polypay flocks. So I suppose that if you really understand what the polypay breed is, and what those contributions are from the four and you really if you if you're a breeder and you understand all of those inputs and you're sensitive to that and you're selecting for all of them so if you have a sheep that exhibits you know all those traits from those four breeds so that would probably be the way that you could make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're breeding for a typical polypay, right? Would you exactly. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Right. So, okay. uh, and, and, and that's pretty much how most polypay breeders across the country approach things. You know, our, our focus again is, and I'm very, very proud of our membership is, is the fact that we have really focused on commercial traits. That's what we do as breeders in the polypay breed. Um, again, nothing against the show ring. I love the show ring. I grew up in the show ring. I've judged livestock. I have no problem with the show ring whatsoever, but the polypay breed is really stuck to not following fads or trends, but just really focusing on commercial traits that actually put money in sheep producers' pockets, you know? So, and those four breeds that we go back to at the beginning were breeds that we felt economically made the most sense to produce the type of sheep that will eventually put money and be uh, make economic sense to a commercial sheep producer. Yeah. So, so this, um, you know, the reason I'm doing this interview is because, part, you know, my guild is doing a, a wool or a breed study on the wool of sheep. And you and I have talked already that you really are more focused, just you just said, on the commercial side. There is an interview I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks with another one of your breeders in your organization, and she's focused a little more on the wool. So we're going to cover that in her interview, and I'm not going to, um, we're not going to talk about that. So if any of you guys are watching this wondering, you know, why I'm not covering that, it's really more about um what makes this breed what they are? What makes this breed um, different from all the others? And that's, you know, that's the goal here for this interview. So what, I mean, what is the biggest challenge right now for the polypay breed? What would you say is the thing you're keeping you up at night as the breed? Yeah, this is a, the, the biggest challenge we have as polypay breeders right now, and this is, uh, is a good challenge, is demand for our genetics right now is so high. Uh, that we simply are not producing, cannot produce, produce enough, especially females, ewe lambs, uh, for commercial producers as, as needed right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're in the sheep business, you know the sheep market has been extremely good. Uh, we're seeing uh, young people getting into the commercial sheep business. 
uh, you know, which is exciting. Uh, demand for our sheep across the country is as high as I've ever seen it in 20 years uh, because people are trying to rebuild flocks, start flocks, really focused on the maternal traits uh, where they really have a sound, solid maternal foundation in their flocks. And polypay genetics have kind of risen to the top of the sheep industry right, right now in terms of, uh, the, you know, producing a, 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 a genetically superior sheep that can work in many different environments from confinement to mountain mountain ranges to pastures to farm flocks. Uh, our sheep work in all those environments and because of that and uh, you know and with the markets the way it's been people have, have money to spend on good genetics now and we've just seen an extremely high demand for our genetics right now and uh, so that's a good problem to have but uh, you know we, I wish we could produce more um, uh, for the demand that we have for polypay genetics right now. How many active breeders are in your organization? Oh goodness. Uh, just roughly. I, <laughs> Roughly, I would say 150, maybe more. I'd have to go back and look. I haven't looked at the number lately, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's we're not obviously not the largest breed of sheep in the country um, in terms of registrations and, and that type of thing. But uh, we are, I would say, probably when you look at the commercial sheep industry, probably one of the top one, two, or three breeds that in, in, that probably have the most influence within the commercial sheep industry right now. So uh, very sought after uh, breed of sheep uh, yeah. for commercial producers. Right. So what's an average flock size then, just to get a size? Average flock size uh, yeah. of actual breeders or the commercial people that we work with? The polypay breeder community. Yeah. The it's a that's another uh, it's it's so diverse you know here in Illinois where I live uh, we run 35 ewes because that's all the grass we have <laughs> we've got enough pasture grass here in the Midwest to, to maintain about 35 ewes and that's right. it however we have uh, you know breeders that have a thousand ewes you know uh, you know so it just kind of depends on your environment where you're at and and how much uh, grass uh, you've got available for, for your flock you know so uh, it just varies in size which is one of the unique things about the polypay breed is you've got farm flocks big range flocks out west uh, confinement flocks here in the midwest now too all producing genetics so we have many different uh, diverse backgrounds in terms of production systems for our genetics so who is your customer can you give me a profile of who you sell to Yep. Uh, customers, uh, you know, in our case, it could be range producers in Utah, uh, you know, uh, that are looking for sheep that can breed out of season. They're looking for sheep that are hardy, maternal, can handle, you know, the mountain environments. Uh, Midwest uh, has become a huge market for polypay genetics or mis Midwestern flocks, uh, where, again, they're looking for multiple births, ability to breed out of season, work in many different production systems. Uh, from confinement to pasture, uh, to dry lot, uh, to east. We're seeing a huge uh, market now for polypay sheep out east, um, uh, where they're looking for maternal sheep that they can cross to make uh, really good 80 to 90 pound market lands for ethnic markets and, and restaurant trade and things like that. So we're seeing a growing number of people using polypay genetics uh, in the eastern United States now as well. So the most of your customers are breeders as well. You're not, you're not selling to market. You're from your flock, right? Exactly. So our 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 focus at, at our farm at Big Prairie Polyphase is to focus on producing a really uh, genetically superior sheep that is extremely good from the structure and the phenotype uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. And our market is selling to commercial producers around the country that are trying to improve their flocks uh, by implementing our genetics into their flocks to try to improve uh, the overall economic value uh, of their uh, of their sheep flocks as well. So I gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So I guess the last question I've got for you is, can you just talk a little bit about your journey? What got you into sheep and, you know, what's yep. your story? Yeah. So our, my story is uh, I grew up on a diversified grain and livestock farm here in Illinois. Uh, so I've been around livestock my whole life, uh, grown up mostly around hogs, though. We were in the purebred hog business growing up. So everything I really learned about livestock selection and learned about uh, livestock production, I learned in the hog business. Oh. Uh, my, gran my grandfather uh, also raised sheep when I was growing up. And I always enjoyed working with him and being around him with the sheep. So I think when I got to, to my own farm, got my own place set up, it was, uh, you know, I was, we had some pasture it made sense that maybe sheep would be the right fit for uh, the operation that we, that we were moving to. Uh, so we started searching around and uh, through our local uh, 
FFA advisor at our local high school, he suggested that we buy some polypay genetics from a friend of his. Uh, and at that time, if you would have asked me what a polypay was, I would have been clueless. I would have had no idea um, because I had uh, uh, I wasn't really that familiar with the polypay breed. But I am so thankful looking back on it now that polypays were the breed that we started with and have stayed with because of the easy keeping nature of the sheep, uh, the extremely good mothering ability of the sheep. For somebody who came from a hog background and getting into the sheep business, they were the perfect breed of sheep for us because they took care of themselves. Right. Uh, they weren't high maintenance sheep which was good uh you know so we we started with with a with a very small flock and have, have grown it we've had up to 70 ewes uh we're back down in the 30 to 40 range now uh but uh that was kind of our start and very very pleased that we that we chose polypays um as the breed of choice at our operation so and we've grown our we've grown our um our our business over the years to where we've we've now sold uh, sheep to over 25 different states um so we've we've um then we feel pretty successful in producing good genetics for for uh, sheep producers all across the country in many different environments and production systems and have a really wonderful customer customer base of, of great sheep producers that are really focused on commercial production across the United States. Yeah. Nice. So I'm just thinking back to your comment that you you breed in the spring for fall lambs because your market that's what they're looking for. So I'm so the commercial producers are looking for fall lambs and that you're you're probably not moving those lambs until they're what 12 weeks old or something like that I mean how does that what's that well mean? actually yeah so so if we lamb in uh September October November we usually don't start sending those ram lambs or those you lambs out to producers until May or June uh, so we raise them all through the winter. Uh, we keep our lambs on our ewes probably longer than most people. I don't wean until 90 to 100 days. Yeah, I mean, those lambs are on their mom, uh, you know, throughout the winter, and they do so good uh, here in the Midwest. They do so good uh, on their moms through the winter. Of course, we're creep feeding as well, and they have access to good quality alfalfa hay, too. Um, you know, so that that's really worked well for us. And then those lambs grow so nice through the winter into the spring. And then we start sending those sheep out to, to the different customers across the country, usually in May and June is when we'll start sending genetics out to go to work for people. So, uh, but the key there, people, you know, you can take a fall born ram lamb, uh, he's ready to breed in the summer. You know, so it really works out good. You can get a good genetically superior ram lamb uh, and put him to work as soon as you get him in the summer or early fall. And the nice thing, too, is because we've selected for naturally conceiving fall lambs, if you do want to accelerate lamb uh, or lamb in the fall, these sheep that we've produced over the past 20 years, genetically, that's what we've selected for. So you can feel pretty comfortable that when you get one of our rams or our ewe our lambs, uh, that they have the genetic potential to lamb out of season, especially in the fall. So interesting. So different from what we're doing. <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you what. It's so much nicer to go to the lambing barn in October than it is in January. <laughs> that yeah. really is. You know, I don't mind dragging myself out of bed at midnight. You know, on October twelfth versus doing that on January twelfth. There's a yeah, big right. difference. You know, so that's why we've always enjoyed uh, lambing in the fall because the weather is so much nicer and those lambs grow so good through the winter. Then, so it's a nice start for them too to be in a warmer environment. Even though you're breeding for you know all sorts of climate and environments and stuff so it's really nice conditions for the babies yeah okay all right well this was really interesting i did not expect to learn the stuff that i did you know about i my biggest question was about you know the the um fallout or outliers but but that explanation for how you can you know breed for the correct polypay really makes a lot of sense to me so yeah so great. Yeah, well, no. thank you so much. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about well, or say about? I'll tell if, if, if people want to see what we do, uh, we're on Facebook, obviously, at Big Prairie Polypays. Uh, you can okay. check us out on Facebook. And then we do have a website as well, www.bigprairiepolypays.com, too, if you want to see kind of how we've designed our sheep. We're very proud of the, very proud of the phenotype of our sheep uh, and then the genetic ability of our sheep in combination. We try to kind of be that intersection, a good phenotype, really solid structure and well-designed sheep and then genetic testing as well so mm -hmm. uh, if you want to see what we do um, yep. and then if anybody ever has questions my gosh just feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email and right. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions yeah you got right back to me so that was great I think um probably my audience is going to want to know you know 
about fleeces and stuff, right? They're going to yeah. ask me, you know, just does Mark sell his wool to hand spinners? Mm -hmm. And um, what do you do? Like, what is your, now that I think. Yeah. So on the wool side, we do shear twice a year and, uh, you know, um, we, we do, our, our sheep do shear well. I mean, they shear heavy fleeces. Uh, our, our shear uh, comment always comments on the quality of our wool, uh, that it's very good quality. So we actually market through a local wool company here in, in Illinois. Uh, they take all of our wool. So uh, we shear twice a year and all of our wool goes to a company called Gronewald uh, Wool here in Forreston, Illinois, which is just not too far away from us. We're very fortunate to have a wool company not far away and sheep Is there a mill? What's that? Is that a mill? Uh, they just collect, uh, they just are kind of a wool buyer. Like a broker. Uh, okay. Yeah, they're a broker. I think most of their wool eventually ends up in China. Uh, is, is where I think it goes, uh, but uh, we're fortunate to have them close and we and fortunate too to have somebody that shears sheep in the neighborhood as well because that's not the easiest thing to find either nowadays oh, is, is somebody who shears sheep. We shear before we go to, we, before we breed, obviously we'll be shearing here in the next couple of weeks because we're going to turn rams in probably by the end of April uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll go ahead and shear those sheep again when we bring them home off of pasture uh, in September and before we start lambing again. So we'll, we're sanitary. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we just like to get the wool off of them for those reasons of course going through the summer it keeps them cooler and then going into the winter believe it or not it keeps them you know if you're in the wool uh, been around sheep and wool it keeps them drier uh you know uh in the winter too having all that wool off of them yeah. you know and more comfortable through the winter too so but uh, we really because we shear twice a year we don't really ever see a, a super long length on the wool because because we do it twice a year but right. Right. Um, you know our use on average i would say probably shear you know 10 12 pounds a year Somewhere in there, I don't know if that's good or bad or, <laughs> or otherwise. Yeah, there's no, yeah, it doesn't. Really, that's not something that there's no. Um, it's not really a thing with hand spinners in terms of the weight of the fleece. Um, yeah. It's more about that staple. Yeah. Dimension. So would you say it's more like one and a half if, if you're shearing twice a year? Which is still yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, wool quality on polypase has always traditionally been very good because there are some wool breeds in our background, you know. Yeah, so, right. so the polypase does have a, it has really good wool quality. Yeah. Uh, and you'll get to talk to your you know, to Ann Salmons about this because she's heavily involved in spinning and 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 wool uh, and wool quality, and she'll be able to fill you in more on this. But uh, as yeah. I kind of told you earlier, because around here when we shear, we just assume that we're not going to make money on our wool. I've never, believe it or not, made a dime selling wool. Uh, it just doesn't happen around here. So obviously, when you're not making money at wool, that doesn't become, you know, a primary focus of your selection uh, on your sheep uh, because it just economically, you know, isn't doing anything for your pocketbook, you know. So, but uh, that being said, polypays traditionally have had very good wool, you know. Uh, and that goes back to the fact that they were originally designed out in the Western ranges where wool is very important, um, mm -hmm. you know, so the polypays were designed with that in mind as well. So. Interesting. Very cool. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. This was a lot of fun. Enjoyed getting to know more about the breed and talk to you for a little bit. So thank you. Yeah, so much. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and uh, you know, I really enjoyed it and look forward to seeing, uh, seeing the show. And uh, if you need anything else, let me know. And if any of your viewers have any questions, just tell them to let me know and, and I'll be more, happy, more than happy to answer their questions. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.